you know, email sign up pop ups or other pop ups in general. Um, I actually don't think they're very effective. I I don't. I, th there are lots of other techniques that we can use if we're trying to get people who are qualified to join our mailing list. And I think the reason why pop ups have become so prevalent is because they do kind of work. And but that doesn't mean that what we can't measure for. See, the problem with measurement is that you're measuring the impact of something, but you're not able to measure how something increases annoyance, right? Because annoyance can't really be measured. Hi, this is Kalil Gulivala. Welcome to another episode of the Experiment Nation podcast. And today's episode, I'm excited to have Rishi here with us. Rishi is a Shopify product guy. And what's unique about his, uh, about his approach is that of all visitors to the website, he laser focuses on the narrow segment of people who are interested but need a little, little bit more convincing. Rishi, uh, glad to have you here today. I'm so excited to be here, Khalil. Uh, thank you for that intro. And I'm looking forward to providing as much value as I can to to any anyone who's in this in this on this conversion optimization journey and i'm looking forward to our chat amazing rishi you know i gotta ask you you know i would love to have some kind of like, like a tagline as like the shopify product page guy like how did how, 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 how did you manage to get that that uh that that that, that tag associated with you you know i uh, i think the when i started off i didn't have any particular love for product pages. I was only interested in identifying friction and busting friction. So we tested on the homepage, we tested on email pop-ups, we tested on the category page. We did lots of testing on the checkout flow because the theory was that, you know, a 5% improvement on checkout is a direct 5% improvement on the bottom line because everyone has to flow through checkout. And so kind of an equal opportunity optimizer. And then what happened was obviously that natural course of events, I started doing lots of testing. We, te we tested on landing pages as well, and we tested on product pages as well. And what I discovered was that for some reason, product page, when we made meaningful changes to the product page, we were seeing this registering this pretty significant improvement in conversion rates. And I was like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So I kept on double clicking on that. And eventually we realized that the product page was the most important page, at least for the kind of experiments that we were running. And when we reverse, when you kind of work backwards to understand why that is, I it made very clear sense to me. And so the way it works is that when someone first comes to a website, whether you drop them on your homepage or you drop them on your landing page, the first thing they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out like, it's kind of like being parachuted into a different country. The first thing you want to do is, have I landed in the right country, right? So you're trying to orient yourself. And so when they come to a landing page, let's say you're selling a supplement that relieves back pain. And that, you know, when they come to the landing page, the first thing they want to know is that they want to say, I want to see the specific product that you are selling that solves this problem. So there's a tendency to quickly, and we notice this even in session recording. So this isn't just like a, you know, once we noticed that product pages were driving conversion rates, we started looking at evidence to understand why the user behavior, why product pages mattered. And in session recordings, we noticed that when they would come to a landing page, even though the landing page had a ton of content for them, they were essentially ignoring that content and they were very quickly clicking through from the landing page to get to some page that was giving them information about a very specific the, the solution to the very specific problem that they were having. Now that answer is not on the homepage because the website might be selling 10 different supplements. One is for foot pain, one is for different things, right? So the homepage doesn't answer that, that back pain question, and but the product page does. And so they would very quickly come to the product page, but once they got to the product page, they would come to a grinding halt because everyone, you, me, and our moms know that once you go beyond the product page, at some point, you're going to be pulling out a credit card. Now, they don't want to do that. So the product page became this almost like the Grand Central Station where they were spending most of their time to understand if they should move forward or not or if they should leave the website. And because they were spending so much attention on the product page, the purchase decision was being made on the product page. And that's how... That's why product pages were having such a big impact. And so that's essentially the backstory for um, how we decided to focus in on product pages.
Amazing. And at the same time, you know, when you think about product pages, you know, there's so much effort put into it. And it just comes off to me. I think if, you know, people have like pop-ups and stuff like that, show up on product pages, you know, like what, 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 are, your, what, are, what are your thoughts on pop-ups given that I see them everywhere on every website right now? You know, email sign-up pop-ups or other pop-ups in general, um, I actually don't think they're very effective. I, I don't, I, th there are lots of other techniques that we can use if we're trying to get people who are qualified to join our mailing list. And I think the reason why pop-ups have become so prevalent is because they do kind of work. And, but that doesn't mean that what we can't measure for, see the problem with measurement is that you're measuring the impact of something, but you're not able to measure how something increases annoyance, right? Because annoyance can't really be measured. And so this is the reason why we just, every brand is doubling down on pop-ups and because they're looking at their competitors and they're seeing their, that their competitors are using, using it as well, the assumption is they must know something we don't know, let's double down on pop-ups. So I, I don't think they're as effective as we think they are, number one. And if the question is like, you know, on the product page, like, you know, what's the element that matters the most? I think there are two elements, there are three elements actually, well, there are four elements that matter quite a bit. One is of course the offer. The offer really matters. Um, so if you have an offer that's compelling, it is going to have a pretty big impact on conversion rates. Your product image gallery really matters as well. And I'll explain to you why. You know, the the control, the, the point of reference for the shopper is offline shopping, right? When I'm thinking of buying something online, in my mind, the anchor is the experience of going to a retail store and buying the product. And in the pro in the retail store, one of the things that we all do, whether it's useful or not, is we we inspect the product. We lift it up. We kind of look at it from different angles. We read the label. We read behind the label. And the image gallery on the product page is essentially acting as a proxy for that behavior. So that's a very popular area. We, When we look at uh, recordings, we find that, you know, 50% of people will go through the image gallery. Many people will go through multiple images. And so it's a pretty high hotspot. The third area that's really important is... Hi, this is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. If you'd like to connect with hundreds of experimenters from around the world, consider joining our Slack channel. You can find the link in the description. Now back to the episode. The the customer reviews. So if you have reviews, people want to read those reviews because that's evidence that the product works. The fourth area, the one that gets the least amount of attention and the one that I focus on exclusively is the product description itself. So I think a lot of brands are very aware of the importance of the image gallery and very aware of the importance of the product, uh, sorry, of the um, reviews and stuff like that. And they give it appropriate attention. They just don't care enough about the description and therefore, the description is very boring. It's like, you know, this product helps you with back pain. It's very good. Here are five bullet points to talk about why it's so good. Buy it. And I think the description needs to do a lot more. And so I think the description is the most important element on the product page. Thanks, Rishi. And if I can quickly clarify, you, 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 I think you mentioned sort of four elements, right? You mentioned sort of the offer, you mentioned the image, you mentioned sort of the product description. Was there, was there a fourth category as well? Yeah, reviews, the reviews. Give me a miss that. And maybe, maybe that's interesting, Rishi, because, you know, I think you, I read online, you know, you've talked about how like your big insight was when you saw someone go into a store, they're picking up an object, putting it back down. You said, at the end of the day, the person in charge of sales would look at the sales, but it wouldn't factor in the person who was kind of you know, deciding between the object. Is it something qualitatively, in I think of a package in store is not this huge thing. It's a small, tiny object. Is there something specifically about online that requires a greater description than let's say a physical object? Is it just because they're two different medium or is it just that people have maybe more bandwidth to read on an, on, on an online page versus a physical? Well, page? so that's a great question. So the reason why, so this is interesting. It's, it's you know, causation versus correlation. Um, when you go to a retail store, if you're looking up any kind, if you pick up a product, you'll notice the description is, you know, the description of the product is very short and to the point. So the assumption is, oh, maybe that's because consumers don't care about more content. And so we'll follow that same principle online. But it's actually correlation. It's not causation. The reason why on the product package, the description is very small is because in a retail store, there is a physical cost of having a bigger package and the, you know cost more material costs, but there's also higher shelf costs. So if I if there's a bottle that I'm selling that has, you know, um, I, I don't know, 
one inch by one inch dimensions, I want to be as close to one inch by one inch as I can with my packaging because I want to keep my shipping costs low. And that is why our description is so limited when you pick up a product on the retail store. And so I think that the way to think about it, and I, th this is this is a long-standing debate, and I actually think it's a pointless debate we have about should the content be long or should the content be short? The content should be long, and I'll tell you why. Because when you have short content, you are dissatisfying people who wanted longer content. However, if you have long content and if someone is convinced in the first three sentences, they're, they're not forced to read the whole content. They can they can just make, it, make a purchase. So essentially longer content is more backwards compatible with more different types of buying personalities, but shorter content isn't forward compatible with people who need more content. And so always have more content. And there are many ways in which you can kind of uh, deal with this. If you're concerned about, for example, uh, pushing, you know, the, the layout of the page, pushing stuff below the fold, then you can maybe show the first two, pa the first maybe paragraph, and then they can, you can have a little read more button. And then when you click on it, then you can expand out the content because at that point, the user is telling you, I want to read more. So they're they're casting their vote. So it, it's a very simple sale to make at that point to say that let's give them more content. But by default, you're not showing, overwhelming them with a ton of content. But I think this, I think trying to convey, trying to convey the benefit of a complicated product that requires seven sentences of explanation in two sentences is the reason why descriptions are so terrible. Because in two sentences, you are essentially boiling it down to, this will help your, improve your health. And well, that's not substantiated. There's it's not enough context there. And you need seven sentences. And so I think more content is is the way to go about it. Interesting. You know, when you think about also, I wonder if the other element as well is in terms of like, let's call it the time factor, right? You're in a store, you're physically there, you've got, in some sense, you know, I realize it is forced to make a choice. But online, you, as you said, you have to determine the time to look at the different images, spend time, navigate, look at the offer, look for sales. And why I mentioned that, because when you mentioned sort of above the fold, right? Because that's where you first start off. So but would, would you mind talking about, what do you think are the key elements that someone should definitely have above the fold? Um, so I don't have a strong opinion about that. I actually don't focus that. I think that the the if there's one element, again, since I'm a copywriter, I look at the world from a copywriting perspective. I think that the core idea that I want to communicate to a visitor, especially a first-time visitor above the fold, is that we're different and here's how we're different. That's the core idea. Yeah. What that does, when you say we're different, it automatically creates a contrast against other other alternatives. Remember, Arf, when the first you when the user first lands on the website, they have multiple tabs open. They're looking at multiple, they're considering multiple alternatives. So when you say we're different, you're automatically saying indirectly, you're saying we're different from, from other brands. And that makes you stand out. And then when you say, here's how we're different, you're giving them, it's called the slippery slide effect, where you're kind of giving them a compelling reason to continue reading, to understand why you're different. So that is what I try and communicate above the fold. Like if I can do that, then the above the fold part has done its, the purpose of the above the fold is not to close the sale. The purpose of the above the fold is to prevent them from exiting in 10 seconds and get them to read what's more, what's on the page. Amazing. And one thing there, Rishi, I want to kind of focus a little bit more. Now, you mentioned sort of, you know, uh, you, you talk about branding, right? And I know sometimes for some companies, the question is, do they start with sort of the company brand and then kind of talk about the product brand, right? if you want the product brand or product brand, company brand, any thoughts on the, on the product page? What, 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 what should someone be leading with? Yeah. So I, for first time buyers, I always start with the company story, with the company brand. So imagine, again, I like to think in terms of analogies. Imagine if you saw an ad in a newspaper for a, a, a play, uh, you know, an Xbox unit, and you've been wanting to buy one, and let's say the typical retail price was $570, and you saw an ad, and it said, we're selling it for $320. And you're like, that's good. And the name of the store is, it's a retail store, right? So it's called, you know, it's an ad. And the retail store is, you know, um, Ollie X. You've never heard of these guys before, right? And, it, you know, a lot of consumers won't even drive to the retail store because they're like, who the hell is Ollie X? Never heard of this guy, never heard of this company. Even though the price is compelling, I'm my red flags are all over the place. Whereas 
Best Buy, even if Best Buy gave like a 5% discount, you would you would drive to Best Buy because you trust that brand, you know who they are. Even though Best Buy has nothing to do with the Xbox, right? I mean, it's just literally the, it's like a, they just have, they're just a retail store that has an Xbox. Like if the Xbox is crappy, um, Best Buy is not responsible for that. So, but still you give a lot of credibility to Best Buy because you trust them. So I think the same happens when someone comes to the website. You might have a product that promises to do lots of wonderful things. You might have lots of social proof. But if I don't trust the people behind the product, which is basically the people behind the company, then whatever you say about the product is meaningless to me. And so I feel personally that the right sequence is to very quickly first get them over the uncertainty about you as a company and then get them over the uncertainty of the product as a product. Amazing. Now, Rishina, here's where I want to kind of get to maybe the focus, which is really about copywriting and the power of words. Now, you know, when you talk about, you know, with, for example, can you share like what is your process when you do that kind of copywriting? Let's say you say, you know, that first sample is sort of, you know, credibility of the company and then credibility of product. How, 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 how do you tackle that? So what we've discovered is that, and again, whatever I'm talking about, I am qualifying this for first time buyers. So I think it's important to understand that there's a very big difference between someone who goes to Best Buy and has been buying from Best Buy many times versus someone who is walking into a Best Buy store for the very first time. And I am focused on that first time buyer. Now for those first time buyers, what we've discovered is that irrespective, and this is why I think that these lessons will be universal for all of your listeners, because whether they're selling a bed frame or they're selling roller skates or they're selling skateboards or back creams, um, back pain creams, it's the same, the same checklist. So the reality is that consumers see 347 ads every day. It is mathematically impossible for them to objectively do a pro pro and cons analysis of the claim made by every ad. And so our brains being the energy efficient machines that they are have developed these shortcuts for us to quickly make decisions. And through the course of experimentation, we've discovered nine filters that people use when they're buying a product for the first time. Now, not to say that there's only nine filters. What I'm saying is that these are nine common filters that apply no matter what they're buying. Um, so when I do copywriting, I am really focused on making sure that those filters have been satisfied. So one of the filters is too good to be true. So I basically ask myself, is there a claim that we're making here that comes across as being too good to be true? Is our price point and our discount coming across as being too good to be true? Is the other images in our image gallery where we show lifestyle images feel seeming too exaggerated where it doesn't seem too good to be because all of those too good to be true feelings actually act as a break for the consumer because they're like, wait a minute, this something doesn't add up here, right? So similar to that, we have eight other checklist items. And so what I do is when I'm working for a brand, I basically go through those checklist items and I ask them, I interrogate the client and I say, okay, well, this image seems too good to be true to me. What would you, how would you, what can you say in order for me not to feel that way. And usually the client has maybe another asset, maybe there's an explanation, some context that I didn't have. And so I'm able to make updates to that image. And I wanna make sure that there's nothing on the page that feels too good to be true. So so that's my copywriting process. I kind of go through this checklist of items and I, um, and and by the way, this is available on my blog as well. So I'll, I, I, you know, um, we can talk about it later on, but bottom line is that I go through that checklist item, checklist of items and I, make sure that those criteria have been satisfied. Amazing, Rishi. Now, um, as we come towards the end of the episode, check, is there anything that you want to focus on a highlight, like you mentioned, like your blog? Oh, t- 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 tell me more about that, please. Yeah, I think I think the, the big takeaway here is that number one is that um, product pages really matter, copy really matters, focusing on first-time buyers really matter. So anyone who's listening, who's kind of nodding their head or all three things, they will get a lot of value by going to my website, which is frictionless-commerce.com. And once you go to frictionless-commerce.com, on the top right corner, you will see uh, on desktop and on mobile, there's a hamburger menu, you'll see a blog. And in that blog, the first article right on top, because we kind of always bubble it to the top, is nine truths about online shoppers. And in that article, I list that filter mechanism, those nine criteria. 
I think they'll get a ton of value from it. We give examples. We have um, we connect to case studies from the blog as well. And I think for someone who is interested in understand knows that word ma words matter, understands that product pages are important, and understands that converting first time buyers is drives meaningful revenue impact, they will get a ton of value from that article. Amazing, Rishi. So and, if, and if you mentioned you mentioned the website, Frictionless Commerce, but you know, if someone want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what are the different ways they can get in touch with you? I think the best place to go is frictionless-commerce.com. That's where they'll find all of all of the ways in which they can contact me. There's a link from there to my newsletter. There's a link from there to my YouTube channel. There's a link from there to my LinkedIn page. So I would say, let just go to frictionless-commerce.com and you will actually, my homepage is also very interesting. I think people will find it quite interesting. I just launched it, uh, re redesigned it maybe like a, a week or two ago. Um, I'm doing something kind of radical. So I would say even just out of curiosity, I want the listeners to go to frictionless-commerce.com and tell me what they think about the homepage. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much for being a guest today, Rishi. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Hi, this is Romo Santiago from Experiment Nation. If you'd like to connect with hundreds of experimenters from around the world, consider joining our Slack channel. You can find the link in the description. Now back to the episode.